Hi everyone, in this lecture we are going to spend uh, a little bit of time talking about the air, the atmosphere, and air pollution. So in order to understand more about the threats uh, to the atmosphere, and we're going to be spending actually sort of two lectures discussing this topic, I'm going to break the first lecture up into a discussion of <clears throat> specific air uh, pollutants, and then I'm going to take the next lecture and talk about um, other threats to the atmosphere other than just air pollution. So uh, things such as uh, climate change and um, ozone depletion and some other things. So uh, let's start though with talking about the atmosphere and different types of pollutants first, some of the impacts of those pollutants and some of the things that we can do to actually control those. So in order again to sort of understand the problem, first we understand have to understand how the system works uh, just to sort of naturally itself. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to give you a really, really brief information about uh, the atmosphere. And if you sort of think of our, our planet, uh, we have this gaseous envelope that surrounds it. And this atmosphere is what makes life on Earth possible. So we know that there are many other planets in our solar system. Um, however, because they do not have that envelope, uh, they don't have the ability to help to block out potentially damaging UV rays and to hold in gases necessary for life. That's one of the things that makes air, uh, excuse me, that makes Earth unique. And as it turns out, if you were to take a look at the composition of our atmosphere, um, it's mostly in the form of gaseous nitrogen. So um, almost 80% of the atmosphere is a, is a gas that doesn't really impact us as, as animals one way or the other. Um, I will say though that hopefully from the nitrogen cycle, um, you have learned that nitrogen uh, is very important and there's a, a very important role that nitrogen plays as it cycles through um, ecosystems. And again, you learned that one of the major sources of nitrogen happens to be the atmosphere. Um, but as far as animals are concerned, it, it doesn't really sort of do much for us. It's there, um, but it's not what we call biologically available for us. But the other gases in the atmosphere um, are what we're going to focus on. So 21% is oxygen. And this is, of course, incredibly important because oxygen is what animals need in order to carry out the process of what we call cellular respiration. So we breathe oxygen in and in uh, a process in what our cells do called cellular respiration, that uh, oxygen is used actually to, um, as a, basically as a, as a carrier molecule, if you will, for carbon molecules that we're breaking down for energy. Long story short, we need oxygen to survive. Um, <clears throat> other major gases are argon. So don't talk a lot about argon or the uses of argon. Uh, again, it's practically inert for our purposes. And then these very other small categories here. So less than a half of a percent of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And then um, three tenths uh, of a percent happen to be what we're gonna call these other gases. And interestingly enough, especially in our next uh, discussion of global atmospheric changes, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about sort of these other two categories. So <clears throat> this is a, a nice visual that gives you some information about the atmosphere. There are different layers of the atmosphere. Uh, the majority of our discussion happens here in the troposphere. So this is where, um, this is the layer of the atmosphere closest to Earth. This is where you have weather. It's occurring. So you get um, uh, wind and moisture most of your clouds, most of your storms, all of those things are happening here in the troposphere. The only other layer we'll talk a little bit about is the stratosphere, and simply because this is where uh, the ozone layer happens to be. And so um, it also, uh, we have a discussion on, on problems that we're having um, and have been having for some time with threats to the ozone layer. So then you can extend beyond that into the mesosphere and thermosphere. But again, for our purposes, we're gonna kind of focus down here towards the layers of the atmosphere closest to the Earth. So the atmosphere provides a variety of services. So we talked a little bit about this in our ecosystem lecture, this discussion of things that natural systems do for us without us having to pay for them. So it doesn't cost us anything to have these services. They're provided to us for free as long as the system is intact and is working well. So the atmosphere, again, protects us from all kinds of things coming from 
essentially space. UV radiation, x-rays, different types of cosmic rays. There's an awful lot of stuff that's coming at us and the atmosphere protects us from that. It also keeps our temperature within a living range. So some of that solar energy that is coming to the Earth is absorbed uh, by land and it is uh, again sort of held in, if you will, by our atmosphere. And having that living range is incredibly important because it is what makes our planet habitable. We're able to have a, a moisture content that provides liquid water here on planet Earth that we need to survive. It's important again in the process of photosynthesis, which is how plants and other green organisms synthesize um, food molecules, right? So they, they take carbon dioxide out of the air and they um, use carbon dioxide and solar energy to, to make food. And then again, the process of respiration, which I already talked about. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about atmospheric circulation, only enough to say, only enough to say that um, the, the air is circulated around the earth. So warm air, uh, around the equator and cool air uh, that's generated at the poles um, goes through this uh, mixing process or convection as we call it uh, and what it does is it causes um, a mixing of warm and cool air which which again creates livable conditions uh, on a lot of surfaces of the planet. So the atmosphere again provides important services, uh, provides a source of again oxygen and carbon dioxide helps keep the planet livable, protects us from bad stuff happening outside of Earth. So what are we doing? Well, unfortunately, in the process of industrialization, of manufacturing things and having transportation and industry and energy and all of these processes, we create a variety of pollutants. And pollutants, specifically in this case air pollutants, are any type of chemical, it can be a gas, a liquid, or a solid, that is present in our atmosphere in levels that are harmful to humans, they're harmful to other living things, or they're even harmful to uh, materials, so um, buildings and things like that. We can break them down into two different types of pollutants. We have primary and secondary pollutants. A primary pollutant is something that is harmful immediately when it is enters into the atmosphere. So as soon as it goes in the atmosphere, no changes have to occur. It's a pollutant and it's harmful. Secondary air pollutants are a little bit different. This is when we actually take primary air pollutants, so things that are already harmful in the atmosphere, and they actually begin to either interact with each other or they begin to interact with the water vapor or the sunlight in the air, and they turn into a different type of pollutant than which are called secondary air pollutants. So here's a graphic which again is just sort of showing you different types of primary air pollutants and how they change into secondary air pollutants. Please note that not all air pollutants are always man-made. So we do have lots and lots of human sources of air pollutants, but there are actual natural sources of air pollutants as well. So um, volcanic eruptions, although they don't happen a lot, they do happen uh, in enough frequency that we can have um, ash and smoke and different types of particulates that are coming from there. Uh, burning of fires, whether they are fires that are sort of natural fires or whether they're fires started by humans, those can also create primary air pollutants. So they come from lots of different sources. Um, we've got different classes of air pollutants, so we can break them down into categories and we call, can call them primary and secondary. And then we can take air pollutants and break them down even further into certain classes. And, and one class that we talk a lot about is referred to as particulate matter. And particulate matter consists of either solids or liquids. Um, so this would be very small dust type particles or mists that are suspended in the atmosphere. So these are things that um, are not gases. So these again are solids and liquids. They stay in the atmosphere and again they're toxic. They can even be carcinogenic. So examples of these would be things like um, dust from soil. So if you have a, a lot of dust that gets into the atmosphere that's considered particulate matter. Um, soot from burning things. Uh, lead, asbestos, uh, even sea salt and sulfuric acid. So we've got lots of different types of things that can be again suspended in the atmosphere and in great enough concentrations, they can cause problems. So they can scatter or absorb light, they can reduce visibility, they can corrode things. Eventually, 
most particulate matter will settle out. Settle out means they'll eventually fall back to the ground, right? Um, it depends on the size of the particulate. The larger it is, the faster it will fall out. Um, the smaller it is, the lighter it is, the longer it'll stay in the atmosphere. Um, and the biggest problem as far as humans are concerned when it comes to particulate matter is these are things that we inhale. Um, on a regular basis. So particles that are, again, suspended in the air, we walk around, we breathe these things in, especially in congested or highly congested areas where we've got lots of transportation, lots of cars, lots of buses, lots of trains. Those are the places where you're most exposed to inhaling those particulates. And the smaller they are, the more problems they cause because they get deep into our lungs and we can't clear them out efficiently. So your body's pretty good at clearing things out that get in your throat. So if you breathe in dust or, or, or um, pollen in the air, you'll, you'll cough or you'll sneeze and that's your body trying to get rid of it. These types of particulates are so tiny and so small that they can sort of come in almost undetected and they get sort of locked in our lungs and long-term exposure can be very dangerous. Um, these are just sort of uh, different characteristics and categories for a whole host of different types of pollutants. So you can sort of, again, read about those. These are some experiments that we do um, looking at different types of particulates and uh, or different types of air pollutants in general and just the impact that they can have on all kinds of living things because it's not just animals that are impacted by pollutants, but it's plants as well. So where do they all come from? Again, they're not all human generated. Uh, some are, uh, again, responsive volcanoes or even plants, if they feel threatened, can produce compounds. But the majority of what we're discussing when we're talking about air pollutants come from humans. And the largest source by far is transportation. Industry is your second largest source of pollutants. So uh, in transportation, it's our gasoline. Uh, when we burn gasoline, our gasoline breaks down and releases nitrogen oxides, carbon oxides, particulate matter, something called hydrocarbons, um, all kinds of things. So again, if you're if you're looking at where all of this is coming from, really your sources are when you're burning something. You burn something, you make air pollutants. So in the case of transportation we're burning fuel. In the case of industrial processes, again, you're using something for energy, you're using coal, you're using oil, whatever it happens to be. And then you'll notice uh, this category, fuel combustion other than vehicles. So these will be things like your lawn mowers or your gas powered leaf blowers or anything like that, snowmobiles, whatever is using a combustion engine is producing pollution. And then we have a miscellaneous category, things that kind of don't fall neatly into any one of those. So why are we concerned? Well, all kinds of things. So uh, pollutants, especially long-term exposure of pollutants, can do a lot of things. We're especially concerned about the respiratory tract because we're breathing and inhaling these things in, but it also is bad for the eyes, it's bad for the nose, it can attack materials, it can cause health conditions to worsen. So people who have lung diseases or cardiovascular disease are particularly at risk when it comes to uh, the types of pollutants then they're exposed to. We also know that it harms plants, so it reduces pro uh, the productivity of, of plants. Um, it's involved in other things as well, which we'll talk about in a different uh, lecture, acid rain, which we call acid deposition and global warming and ozone depletion. For humans in particular, um, again, any type of lung condition can be uh, exacerbated or worsened by air pollution. So uh, emphysema and bronchitis, for example, asthma, uh, you name it. So there are definitely very specific ways that humans are directly impacted by especially high levels and continued exposure to air pollutants. Uh, urban areas tend to have um, a few types of pollutants that are a, a little bit unique, um, and these are two different types of smog. One is what we're calling industrial smog, and one is photochemical smog. So industrial smog is also known as smoke pollution. So when you have coal burning power plants that are uh, producing coal, and you typically have these in urban areas, they're producing all kinds of smoke pollution and there's sulfur oxides and nitrous oxides and all kinds of stuff in that smoke. Um, this type of smog isn't as big of a problem here in the United States anymore um, because of uh, different types of rules and legislations that we have. This is a really big problem in developing countries. Um, but in developed countries, we have rules that make this type of smog less 
problematic. The smog we struggle with is photochemical smog, and this involves cars. So especially in the summer when there's lots of light, um, smog happens when you have hydrocarbons and nitrogen oxides that are being released from the tailpipes of cars. They interact with sunlight to produce this haze. And again, we don't have too much of a problem with smog um, here in the Chicago area, mostly because Lake Michigan helps to blow a lot of that out. Uh, but if you do go to other parts um, of the country, especially um, the Southwest, places like Los Angeles in particular, um, they have are notably um, bad for their problems that they have with smog in particular. And again, it's the number of cars that are uh, being used in, in that area. So this is just showing you how uh, photochemical smog happens we also have effects of weather and topography on air pollution. Um, so again, I'm kind of going to trip over that really quickly. Uh, urban heat islands, I will mention these just briefly only because uh, urban areas, in addition to being sort of hotbeds for air pollutants just by the sheer number of cars and industry that you have in an urban area, you also tend to have a lot of heat buildup in the summer in particular. This is because you have so many black surfaces. Um, parking lots and roads and rooftops and all of those things, they absorb that sunlight during the day and then they radiate it back out at night. It just creates a situation where you have um, a higher than average temperature, especially in the evening in urban areas than you do in suburban areas around it. So what do we do about all this? So we recognize that there are problems. There are always problems. But the other side of this is what can we do? What can we do to deal with air pollution? Well, the good news is, is that we've got lots of types of technology that can deal with air pollution. So when it comes to industrial pollution, so what's coming from our coal burning power plants, for example, we have smokestacks that have different types of um, what we call precipitators, electrostatic precipitators. We also have filters, all kinds of things that can help to reduce the amount of pollution that's being reduced. Um, we can do all kinds of things like increase fuel efficiency in vehicles. So the more fuel efficient your car is, um, the cleaner burning it is, which means you're producing less, um, uh, less pollution every mile you drive. So newer cars that are highly fuel efficient uh, uh, produce a lot less pollutants than older model cars that are not. Uh, again, we can modify engines, we can um, clean up spills, so on and so on and so forth. So again, I won't cover all of these. This is just um, an example of an electrostatic precipitator. So uh, essentially, this is what the smoke would look like before the precipitators start working. You use um, positive and negative, basically, um, ions in order to ionize the, the smoke and they fall out because of electricity. And this is what it would look like afterwards. So it makes a really, really, really big difference. Thankfully, here in the United States, we have something called the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act was enacted in the 1970s. And what it did is it set standards and it set standards for all kinds of things. So it's limits on air pollutants from every major group that you can think of. Since the Clean Air Act was enacted, we have uh, decreases in lead, particulates, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, ozone, you name it. We've decreased everything. So the Clean Air Act works. Um, it has dramatically uh, reduced the pollutants here in the United States. So even since the 1990s, which is the last time, um, one of the last times that we sort of re-upped the act, if you want to call it that, we went through and reenacted the legislation, made some changes to it. But even since 1990, so from 1990 until now, you can actually see how uh, emissions have declined. So again, on everything, carbon monoxide, um, nitrous oxides, particulate matters, both small and large, sulfur oxides, um, VOCs or volatile organic compounds. So again, the Clean Air Act really does make a difference. And so in developed countries, this type of legislation, these types of policies make a world of difference when it comes to our air. The problem is air pollution in developing countries. These are places that are just starting to industrialize. So what happens is they're typically using older technology and they don't have standards in place to use those precipitators and those fabric filters and those things that could keep their air clean. The priority is getting the electricity that they need to power their homes and to power their businesses and just to sort of begin this process of industrialization. So 
as great as the air quality is improving in developed countries, unfortunately the opposite is true in developing nations. They also have more and more people who are able to afford cars, but the cars that they're using and the automobiles that they're using, again, are not new. They're older and they have old technology and no pollution control devices. They're still even using leaded gasoline in many cases because that's what's cheap and available. So what's interesting is that respiratory disease is the leading cause of death for children worldwide. It's probably something you didn't think about, right? Um, but more than 80% of deaths in children under five are those who live in cities in developing countries. It's because the pollution is so bad from this process of industrialization um, that you have, um, again, millions and millions of people who, who are suffering the health consequences of it. So this is something you would see in a more, again, uh, urbanizing area in a place that's, that's going through this process of industrialization, all of these smokestacks and all of these power plants, again, trying to start their economy going, but it's at the risk of what it's doing to human health. Um, very quickly, I'm going to talk about indoor air pollution, um, just kind of to sort of wrap things up here. In developed countries, all of our air pollutants are essentially coming from being in our house and being around um, radon and carbon monoxide, cleaning solvents, things we use to clean our homes, uh, dust mites, pollen, those types of things. In developing countries, it's different. Uh, their indoor sources of air pollution are mostly related to cooking fires. So they're still using firewood or animal dung or whatever they have available. And when they need to cook or heat their homes, this is what they're using. And without proper ventilation, uh, you could have a, a lot of people who have um, health hazards and even potentially who die every year from smoke inhalation. So again, this is a little bit more representative of what you would see as indoor air pollution in some of these developing countries. Uh, I'm going to skip over radon. Radon is expensive. Make sure you know about radon. It's a colorless, odorless gas that we know causes lung cancer. Um, we don't have a lot. It's a naturally occurring. Um, it comes basically through your basement or through your crawl space. It happens uh, naturally um, as um, it, radon decays basically in the ground. Certain places have higher concentrations than others. It's something that you should know. You should know what the radon levels of are in your home um, because, uh, once again, it's something that uh, potentially could be deadly over long-term exposure. 